clarity leads to awareness and awareness naturally fuels growth. If you're aware of your current situation, and I mean like really aware that you can't even look away, you're gonna change. Welcome everybody to the Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And and I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Chris Harder Show, where we absolutely believe that both prosperity and generosity can and must coexist. Today, I'm sitting down and we are going to give you a real treat because I'm sitting down with my good friend, Alex Benayan, the author of the international best-selling book, The Third Door. Now, this is his second time on the show. He was on the show a few years ago. So we do a, a quick recap of his incredible story. I mean, his story is one of my favorite stories on the planet. You're going to love it. But then we're going to do a deep dive into this massive act of generosity that he did during the pandemic. And I think it's going to spark a lot of interest, a lot of ideas in some acts of generosity that you can do that will not only help other people, but then as a long tail, as a side effect, of course, help you grow your mission, grow your brand as well. And then we're going to get into this incredible tool that he has created, totally free, by the way, no strings attached, this incredible tool he's created that will help you create massive clarity in just 30 days. I promise, promise, promise you, life-changing tool. I'm going to actually do it now that I had this conversation with him. So listen, get ready for one of the best episodes that we have dropped in a long, long time. And real quick before we get started, quick reminder, text me the word daily. If you want me to text you every single morning that I wake up a positive money mantra or a positive business perspective in order to help you put on the proper colored lenses for the day so you can see the day with a, a positive tilt. Text me the word daily to 310-421-0416. Again, text me the word daily to 310 Zero four one six. All right, get ready. Listen up, because here we go. Well, Alex, my friend, welcome back to the show after two, actually three years we just discovered. How you been? It feels good to be back, man. I'm doing great, and I'm excited to dive in because our last conversation three years ago has kept me hyped for three years. And I'm ready to refuel. <laughs> Glad I could get you through the last three. Hey, it's been kind of a crazy last couple of years. So that's saying a lot. You know what I love about you is we can pick up where we left off. We might only see each other once a year or something like that. But we can always pick up where we left off. And before we get into anything for the audience, I just got to compliment you on that. That makes you the realist, the easiest to connect with. And of course, that's been a big part of your success. But when you're the kind of person that you can just pick up where you left off, of course, the world's going to unfold in your favor. So I just wanted you to know that. Thanks, man. This feels good. Feel free to keep this going for the next hour. Yeah, we'll just compliment <laughs> feels, each other for an hour good. and let people listen. <laughs> this feels great. Thank you. So people could go back and they could listen to the episode a few years ago. But why don't you give us the cliff notes of the gentleman who dropped out of college <laughs> and spent the last, gosh, what's it been? Almost seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, ten years studying now, yeah. other people's success and finding out what that common thread is. I want you to share that story real quick. Like you said, it's been this 10-year journey. And essentially, the entire focus has been obsessively studying the mindset of success. So for business, I you know interviewed Bill Gates, for music, Lady Gaga, science, Jane Goodall, poetry, Maya Angelou, Quincy Jones, Steve Wozniak, Jessica Alba, Pitbull. You know, it's been this really exciting adventure filled with surprising lessons at every turn. And to understand why this whole journey got started, you sort of have to go back 10 years. So at the time, I was a freshman in college, and I was spending every day lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling. And I was going through the, you know, what do I want to do with my life crisis? And to understand why I was going through it, you have to understand I'm the son of Persian Jewish immigrants, which pretty much means, and you know this about me, because you know, I pretty much came out of the womb. My mom cradled me in her arms, 
And then she stamped MD on my ass and sent me on my way. And in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween and thought it was cool. You know, that was my childhood. You know, not surprised why I didn't get many party invites as a kid. Destined you know, not the to coolest be a doctor kid. from day one, right? Yeah, but my grandpa loved it though. So I checked all the boxes. I studied for the SATs. I took all the biology classes. I even went to pre-med summer camp when I was in high school. So by the time I get to college, you know, I'm the pre-med of pre-meds. But very quickly, I find myself lying on the dorm room bed looking at this towering stack of biology books, feeling like they're sucking the life out of me. And at first I assumed, you know, maybe I'm just being lazy. But eventually I began to wonder, maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path somebody's placed me on and I'm just rolling down. So now not only did I not know what I wanted to do with my life, I had no idea how the people who I looked up to, how they did it. And how did Bill Gates sell his first piece of software out of his dorm room when nobody knew his name? How did Spielberg become the youngest director in Hollywood history without a single hit under his belt? You know, this is what they don't teach you in school. So I just assumed there had to be a book with the answers. So I went to the library and I was, you know, ripping through business books and biography and self-help books, assuming there had to be a book, not on a particular age of life, but really a stage. When you're starting something new, when you're gearing up for a big dream, a big goal, how do you find a way to break through? That was the obsession. And eventually I was left empty handed. So that's when my naive thinking kicked in. I thought, well, if no one's written the book I'm dreaming of reading, you know, why not write it myself? Why not? Of course. Yeah, well, you know, why? I thought it was like so simple. I was like, oh, I'll just like call up Bill Gates, interview him, interview everybody else, and I'll be done in a few months. That I assumed was the easy part. The hard part, I figured, was getting the money to fund the journey. And you know this part because oh, this part's amazing. Essentially, I was buried in student loan debt at the time. I was all out of bar mitzvah cash. So there had to be a way to make some quick money. So two nights before final exams, I'm in the library doing what everyone does in the library right before finals. And I'm on Facebook. <laughs> And I'm on Facebook and I see somebody offering free tickets to The Price is Right. Now, I'm going to school in Los Angeles, not too far from where the show films. And, you know, you know, it's the most iconic game show in American history. And my first thought was, what if I go on the show and win some money to fund this book? You know, not my brightest moment. Plus, I had a problem. I'd never seen a full episode of the show before. So I told myself it was a dumb idea and to not think about it. You know, Chris, I don't know if you've had one of those moments where no matter how idiotic the idea, for some reason, it like won't leave your mind. I believe those are placed in you on purpose, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You can look at it from a spiritual perspective and say they're in there. But, you know, from a logical perspective, you're saying, why won't this leave? So almost to prove to myself this is a bad idea, Chris, I remember I was sitting in the corner table of the library, this round table, and I opened up my spiral notebook and I wrote best and worst case scenarios to prove to myself this is a bad idea. I wrote worst case scenarios, fail finals. It kicked out of pre-med, lose financial aid. Mom stops talking to me. No, mom kills me. You know, there's 20 cons. And the only pro was maybe win enough money to fund this dream. It's almost as if somebody had tied a rope around my gut and was pulling me in a direction. So that night I decided to do the logical thing and pull an all-nighter to study. <laughs> but I didn't study for finals. I said at a half the price is right. This is insane. I, I went on the show the next day and did this ridiculous strategy and ended up winning the whole showcase showdown winning a sailboat, selling that sailboat, and that's how I funded the book. It's crazy. Remind me, how much money did that amount to? I think I sold the sailboat for maybe you know $17,000, which for a broke college student is a million bucks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I thought I was a baller. You know, I'm taking all my friends out to lunch at Chipotle, <laughs> you know, free guacamole for everybody. And I was really balling out. And I used that money essentially to start the journey. You know, it took three years to track down Bill Gates, another three years to track down Lady Gaga. And when I had started the journey... There was no part of me looking for that, you know, one key to success. Mm-hmm. You know, we've all seen those business books, those TED Talks, and normally I roll my eyes. Yeah. But what ended up happening over seven years of interviews is I started realizing every single one of these people, it doesn't matter if it was Warren Buffett in Omaha, Nebraska, or if it was Steve Wozniak in Cupertino, every single one of these people treated life and business success the exact same way. And the analogy that came to me is that sort of like getting into a nightclub. There's always three ways in. So there's the first door, the main entrance where the line curves around the block where 99% of people wait around hoping to get in. And we all know that line. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance where the billionaires and celebrities go through. And for some reason, school and society have this way of making us feel like those are the only two ways in. You either wait your turn or you're born into it. But what I learned and what you know very well from your career too is that there's always, always the third door. Always. You jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen. There's always a way in. And it doesn't matter if that's how Gates sold his first piece of software, how Lady Gaga got her first record deal. They all took the third door. It's incredible because 
when I look back on my life and my career, it has not been that first door where 99% of people are. It has not even been somebody escorting me in into the second celebrity, right? Privileged <laughs> door necessarily. It is as much as we want it, right? As, as, as much as that feels good. It's been metaphorically speaking, knocking on and kicking in doors until you finally figure out your way into where you wanted to be. And what's crazy is half the time when you figure out, when you finally get through that door, so to speak, you actually realize that's not the place you want to be anyways. It's one of life's craziest things. Now, I want to fast forward though, using that story to where we are today. Because it's been a couple of years since we talked. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people right now who are wishing that they had clarity around what does success look like for me, the pandemic that happened and, and now, you know, war all over and everything else that is going on in the world. So a lot of people saying, what does this have to do with me? What doors should I be knocking on? Where should I even be aiming? And you did something really unique that I really wanted to ask you about. You spent a year of your time on Zoom for mm. absolutely freaking free, helping people discover and get clarity around what they want to do next. You've got to tell us about this because this is the most selfless act I've ever heard anybody do. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. The plan was definitely not for it to go on for a year. I thought it would be this you know, little quick project in the beginning of the pandemic, but it sort of took a life of its own. Do you think you're going to do it a couple of weeks, a couple of months? I thought I would do it for a few weeks, maybe you know, two months max. Yeah. But as I'm sure you know, whether it's all great loves, all great businesses, you sort of start with a inkling of a feeling and then it sort of says, get in the back seat, motherfucker, we're going. Yep. You know, <laughs> and grabs the driver, steering wheel and it goes. Explain to people what you did. Essentially what had happened was the third door came out and I spent the next few years spending a lot of the time sharing the message as far and wide as possible. So we did, you know, international book tour. We uh, have spent, you know, a lot of time going to different corporations like Google and Apple and Nike and Bank of America to share the principles of the third door, essentially all to focus on how to help people cultivate growth in their careers. Because if I've learned one thing over the past 10 years, it's that success in and of itself is not what people are looking for. And I spent a whole book writing about success. What I've learned after 10 years of studying the subject is that, Chris, what happens when you achieve the thing that you've been working on for years? Three weeks later, you wake up and what do you think? Anticlimactic, you I build something else. What's next? Yep, what's next? What's next? How do I do it better? Yep. Let's say you achieved your dream more than you even imagined. You wonder, how do I do it even better? Let's say you fell short. You wonder, how do I do it even better? Because yep. essentially, and I know people who listen to your podcast specifically have that growth DNA. And again, and sometimes we can, in our society, demonize it and say, oh, oh, just be grateful. Look, you can be grateful and want to grow. You can be content and grateful that you have a great job and know that you have a potential that's still unfulfilled. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, right? You can simultaneously be totally. grateful and aspirational. You can be grateful that you have a loving relationship that actually wanted to still be more expressive, more soulful. So as soon as we realize and almost own the fact that our desire to grow is what makes human beings so special. It's the reason we're not in the caves anymore. It's the reason we have this world that for all of its suffering and all of its misfortunes, does trend to get better over time, it's because we have this aspiration to do better and to grow. It's amazing. You just made me realize something. It's almost unhuman, right? It goes against the way we were built to just sit in pure gratitude and say, well, this is good enough. I don't want anything else. You literally just made me realize if we're not growing, then we are not being human, so to speak, the way that we were built. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. The desire for growth is essential to the human experience. Yep. And I can say, and I'm sure people listening to this can even think of five people off the top of their head right now who have sort of written off the desire to grow and look dead in the eyes. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're 25 years old or 65 years old. The moment you decide you don't care about growing and being a, a better person. And again, the only benchmark is yourself. Yep. The real question is, are you a better person three months from now than you were three months ago? That's how you measure it. And you get to choose. It's not by your bank account. It's not by your job title. It's you get to choose. You go to sleep at night 
as the ultimate judge. You know, whether it's your higher power or it's your conscience, it doesn't matter what the fuck people say about you on Twitter. At the end of the night, if you go home proud of yourself that you did a good day's work, you're going to sleep well. Isn't that the truth? Because people don't know what's going on in your mind and in your real life. So they can say whatever they want, but you can still, even if they're saying horrible things, you can simultaneously be proud of moving from point A to point B because you actually know where point A is and you actually know oh, yeah. what that movement looks like. Yeah, I think it's harder for our generation now than it's ever been before just because of the amount of highlight reels we see on social media. Nonstop, 24-7. And it can distort your thinking of where your progress should be. I feel, you know who I really feel bad on that point is high schoolers, even middle schoolers. I think back to when I was in high school, middle school, I didn't have the pressure to have all the things and accomplish all the things that, you know, you see people flashing now. And I Mm -hmm. can't imagine that immense pressure, much less as adults like you and I. You know, that actually gets back to, you know, your original question, which is how did that, you know, mentor session happen at the start of the pandemic? How did you end up spending every single day on Zoom with hundreds or thousands of strangers? Yeah. So I started to give the context, right? So, you know, the few years after the book came out, it was a lot of speaking to different corporations and organizations. And essentially what happened when the pandemic hit, obviously, you know, live events got stopped. And while I was doing, you know, events virtually, I actually had more time on my hands than I'd had in 10 years. And also there was more suffering going on than I had seen in perhaps my whole life. Yeah. Especially those brutal shutdowns in the beginning, the amount of unemployment, the amount of suffering, the amount of just fear. The uncertainty Mm -hmm. was just Um, like nothing we've ever experienced before. Yeah. And you know, no matter how you view the pandemic, no matter how you view the politics, I think everyone can agree that the level of fear, whether it was appropriate, inappropriate, it doesn't matter. We can all agree that that was some scary shit in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, you're reading articles saying that people are dropping dead and they don't know why that's some scary shit. Yep. So we can all agree with that. And we can all agree with no matter what the state of the economy is, when tons of people lose their jobs, when they were already suffering. Before the pandemic, I believe the average American struggled to even gather $500 before things shut down. So essentially, a mentor of mine had an idea because I was sort of overwhelmed by the amount of suffering going on. And he just said, well, why don't you just go help some people? I'm like, I'm sitting in my apartment. How can I possibly help people? Maybe I'll write a book, but, and he goes, well, Alex, last time you tried to write a book, it took about seven years. So <laughs> <laughs> why don't we do something a bit more timely? And, you know, he's about 60 years old. And I thought it was sort of naive the way he said it. I was like, ah, he doesn't understand the way things scale. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, just put a, a Zoom link on Twitter and see what happens. And I was like, that's, maybe there's a course. Maybe those things take time to build. You don't just sit around on your computer and talk to strangers. And he's like, well, if there's ever a time to just sit around and help whoever shows up. It's it's now, now. yeah. So thankfully, I'm lucky enough that I'm surrounded by people a bit wiser than I am. So I took his advice and I decided for the next 40 days to just for an hour at the same time every day show up. And the intention was as much as I love all my fellow authors and things like that who had all these courses and things like that, I decided if there's ever a time to be helping people Without any money attached to it, it had to be now. So what did it look like? I mean, did you have a plan or was there no plan? Was it just, hey guys, here's the link. Every day I'll be on. Let's see what we talk about. No, I had a plan. Essentially, my plan was I mapped out if the original thesis of the third door is people want to grow and there is a mindset for success. If that's a thesis, there actually is a way to do it. Now, how you're going to do it is going to be different for everyone. I really do believe, and that's the whole premise of the, of the original book, which is there is a mindset to success. Then, if everyone's going to have a different path, how can I give them tools to help them on their individual paths? And that was the premise. So I sort of broke it down to every single day was a different thing you're going to encounter on your journey, whatever that journey is. Kind of a so, mini lesson or something? Exactly. Getting yeah. unstuck, finding your purpose, storytelling, interviewing, writing, public speaking, dealing with rejection, dealing with fear. So, you know, I mapped it all out. And it was this, you know, magical thing where people came from, people were tuning in from Japan, from India, from Nigeria, from Australia, all over the United States. People who worked at Pfizer and Apple and Google were all coming in. A marketing manager at Ford volunteered to be the, you know, the moderator. It was like this really amazing group. And they're all, some of them are still best friends. Incredible. And they uh, met by coming onto this Zoom. So what ended up happening, I didn't even know. 
So this marketing manager at Ford, his name is Brad, had volunteered to moderate because I was busy talking. I couldn't see if there was anything going on in the chat or Zoom bomber. So he was moderating, which was really kind of him. And, you know, at the end of like an hour, an hour and a half every day, I would log off. But on Zoom, it has an option, assign host to someone else. Sure. I would close it myself to go get some water and I would let Brad be the host. But I didn't know is Brad would just like leave it open. Oh, wow. And it sort of became like the equivalent of like hanging out in the lobby after an event. Oh, a free for all of conversation. Yeah, it was, it was a free for all. And you have to think like, you know, the first three days, the kind of people who showed up were people who were motivated. Yeah. By the 15th day, especially if you're thinking, you know, it was 5 p.m. Pacific time. So for some people, it's 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. their time. If they're coming for 15 days, 16 days, 20 days, 30 days, these are people who are willing to do whatever it takes to become better versions of themselves that they know they're destined to be. Yes. And in a lot of those cases, it was people who could use something that didn't have any tuition attached to it or anything like that. So Essentially, all you needed was an internet connection. So you're creating a safe space to gather. You're creating free education. You're creating a space for them to be heard and share ideas. What happens when day 40? Because I heard you say 40 days. What happens when day 40 hit? Were you like, I got to keep doing this? Oh, uh, we were all crying, man. We were all crying. Did you think you were going to shut it down when you started yeah, that well, Zoom day on 40, day 40? I, it was the graduation day, yeah. On day 40, they all shared how it impacted them. And I just, at the end of the day 40, I said, I'm coming back tomorrow. I don't know if you guys want to come back. Total surprise and, to you and to them. To them, yeah. Wow. And we just let it rip. And it was amazing. And this went on for how long? Exactly a year? We kept it going for like every day for 50 days, 60 days, 70 days. And then I sort of started running out of material. So yeah. I started moving it. I started moving it to once a week. And then we kept that once a week going for almost a year and a half. That's incredible. That's nuts. Uh, what do you think is the, it, one of the, your favorite success stories that came out of doing that? You know, so, oh someone's life changes. What's one of them? There's this one woman by the name of Sammy, this entrepreneur by the name of Sammy from Nebraska. And the reason I got to know her is on Zoom, you sort of just see the little squares of people's faces. Mm -hmm. She was a farmer in Nebraska and would Zoom from her tractor every day. Wow. So she was on her tractor every day listening to the sessions, but she also was an entrepreneur doing food and beverage companies. One of the sessions was called Exponential Long-Term Planning. And when I taught that lesson, Sammy knocked it out of the park and it's been almost a year and a half, two years now. And her life has taken 180 degree. She left the farm, started her business, just got married last week, traveling the world. So there's all of these moments like that where you feel like you're part of something larger than yourself. The amount of impact and the trickle down from that impact is immeasurable, right? Much like when a teacher teaches a, a class of 20 And one of those students goes on to do something great that affects maybe 50 people. And someone from there goes, there's no way of tracking the end of that infinite impact that you created by spending a year of your time on Zoom, no strings attached, just giving your knowledge and a space for people together. What was your Um, your own personal lesson out of that? Yeah, I've always heard the cliche, like when you give, you get. I always just sort of roll my eyes as it being some like corny cliche, but I've never felt it more. You know, I, you know, to be honest, I've given obviously to my family and it feels good. I give to my friends and it feels good. And, you know, even with the third door, the motivation was to help readers I may never meet. Even when I do corporate speaking events, you're only there for a couple hours at their company. Yeah. I never spent day after day after day after day after day with people. And the amount of inspiration I got from seeing people Man, when you see like Tarun in India waking up at 4 a.m. every day for like 50 days in a row, you sort of look at yourself and you're like, yo, where's my hustle level at? Yeah. And they're just such good people. It reminded me why I had set up on the journey of the third door in the first place. It was for people like that. It's amazing because you did not, I want to be crystal clear, you did not set out on doing this for any kind of ROI, right? No return on investment. You weren't expecting any kind of gifts or or had a launch at the end no, or something. you know, if like I had that. to be like very searchingly honest with myself, there was definitely a part of me that wanted to like test out some of the material a little to see, because I'd been doing it in a corporate setting. I wanted to see how it worked in a general audience, sort of like how a comedian goes to a nightclub to just test out different material. There was a little bit of that there. And by all means, like, 
I got an ROI on that, which I was like, holy fuck, this material really hits. And it hits globally and it hits people of all ages. So I'd call uh, that a beautiful equal energy exchange. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. That is a perfect equal energy exchange. I want to kind of shift notions a little bit because while you were doing that and the tale of doing that is been everybody switching careers, everyone's switching jobs. It's crazy right now. You go into places, they can't find anyone to hire. You hear about this great <laughs> resignation going on, yeah. right? So jobs are empty over here and yet over here, everyone's switching to new ones. You've become a bit of an expert in this space. Where are all the workers going and what do you think is causing this? I think there's a lot of factors causing it. There's economic factors, there's geopolitical factors, but I also think there's spiritual factors. Mm -hmm. And I think I know from personal experience, you know, five years ago when my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer, I know for myself, when you are sitting in the front row of seeing someone you love suffer or pass away, whether you want to or not, your own mortality comes into view as well. And... It's natural for life's big questions to come knocking at your door. And, you know, once every generation an event like this happens where the entire world faces their mortality, whether they're conscious of it or unconscious of it, mm -hmm. even if you think you have it, let me tell you, you have. Yeah. Let me tell you, the reason you put that piece of cloth on your face is because whether you believe it or not, someone's telling you your mortality is more fragile than you know. So that's why I think it's all also very subconscious too. We had to come to Turin. And, you know, a million people have died in America, nonetheless in the world. So I think there's a spiritual element when you face a giant... Reckoning? Yeah, yeah like a seismic shift. You know, when we're 90 years old, we'll say, remember COVID. We won't say, remember that third Batman movie. We'll say, nope, remember nope, COVID. Nope, yeah. Even though I'm sure the Batman movie is great. We'll say, remember that. And it's those moments where life's big questions come knocking at your door. So I know just from my career and what I do that people were already questioning whether they were on the right path or were burning out before the pandemic. I know because I work with these companies. I know people were burning out before the pandemic. So this just became the accelerator. The tipping All point. of a sudden, you know, God sort of told everyone, go to your room, sit down and think about your life. <laughs> yeah, go think about what you did. Yeah, go think about what you did. You know, for better or for worse, go think about what you did. And yeah, it's not a surprise that I saw a headline from, you know, monster.com that said 90% of professionals in America considered switching careers. Now, obviously not all of them did it, but a lot of them did do it. It's crazy. A lot of them did do it. I actually think it's a glorious opportunity in the sense of it's almost a resurrection, a resurrection of self where a part of you that you feel wasn't aligned, wasn't on your path, died in a way, and you're bringing it back to life, whether that's by choosing a new career or just getting new clarity on the current path you are on. And I know a lot of people right now did it, but I know a lot of people, I still you know, go and talk to friends and talk to people at events, are going through literally right now as we speak. And they're staring at the ceiling and they're even embarrassed to admit they have no fucking idea what's going on in their life. and they shit on themselves because they tell themselves they should be grateful that they even have a job. Other people are suffering. There's, you know, people, there's refugees fleeing. They should be grateful. And, you know, they're right. They should be grateful. And it's totally okay to have an inner angst of, I'm not on my path. That keeps coming up in this, in this show, right? You keep bringing us back to this thing that it is perfectly okay to be equally grateful and, right, it's not a zero-sum game, and also wondering what's next. What's next? So I created, based on all of my interviews from the third door, I created a tool to help professionals of all stages figure out what's next in their career. This thing's awesome. Yeah, thank you, man. And what's fun about this is I've tested out on executives at Google. I've tested it out on interns and college students. I've tested it out on single parents who have no time on their hands. I've tested out with people who have tons of time on their hands. Um, so I've really been testing this out because essentially my goal, there's that famous quote from Einstein that says, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Yeah. So I've essentially been trying to see how simple can I possibly make this tool and exercise that it still provides insight, but you're not signing up for a 10-week online course. Yep. And I call it the 30-day clarity challenge. 
And that is what everybody needs right now is clarity. The thesis of this, what I've learned is that clarity leads to awareness and awareness naturally fuels growth. If you're aware of your current situation, and I mean like really aware that you can't even look away, you're going to change. Yep, it's inevitable. It's in your face. You're going to change. You know, that's why people are afraid of therapists because they bring you awareness, <laughs> bring you awareness. and people don't want to change. <laughs> yep. That's why life coaches are effective. They just sort of hound you every week saying, yo, you keep telling me you're unhappy here. What are you going to do about it? You know, awareness leads to growth. But the question is, where does the awareness come from? It comes from clarity. Yeah. And clarity has always been an elusive thing that we hope strikes us. But what I've learned is that the most successful people, people who achieve their goals, the people who continue to grow at every stage in their life, have natural ways to cultivate that clarity. Mm -hmm. And I've really brought it down into its core. So you really if anybody brought it down listened, into like five steps, right? Literally five steps. So if I were talking to any of your listeners right now who said they are craving that clarity, if something inside of them is saying like, hell yes, I want it right now, this is how you do it. And it's super simple. It costs a dollar to do. Because all you have to do is take that dollar, go to a pharmacy or an office supply store and buy a brand new notebook. This is what I love about you, by the way. This is probably where everyone's like, oh, here it is. The shoes drop and here's this program. You're like, it costs a dollar. Right. And it goes to the no store for the notebook. <laughs> it goes to CVS. <laughs> I'm happy when other people are helping themselves. Yep. I don't get any satisfaction if people say, you changed my life. Because the truth is, I know I just was a part of them changing their life. Sure. Yep. You just provided a little bit of a, a yeah, framework. Yeah. And also, what the fuck do I know? You know, I have this big belief. Like, I like to tell people, don't shit on me and I won't shit on you. Don't tell me what to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I'm not going to shit on anyone. What I am saying is if you're craving clarity, this is something that may help. So step one, take a dollar, go buy a damn notebook. Go buy a notebook. And it's whenever people come to me at the end of the 30 days and say it didn't work, I said, did you do step one? And they go, no, no, no. I just like wrote it on my phone. And I said, get the fuck out of here. I told you step one, let's go get a notebook. So step one, go get a brand new notebook. And the reason, again, I'm sure someone much smarter than me can explain the science around it. But your brain does think differently when you create a sacred practice. You're signaling and even just a new getting step. a brand new notebook. It's sort of like the difference. Like, have you ever? I don't know. For me, I'm sort of going on tangents here because you're my homie, and I like going on tangents. You know, when you like put on like cool running shoes, mm -hmm. you somehow feel faster. Yes, that yeah, run yes, the, is the best run. The first time in the new running shoes. Yeah, you're just like, or a new shirt or something like that. You just feel cooler. And you, mm -hmm. there's something about that motivation of like, oh man, like it's game time. And that new notebook has that effect. You get that notebook and already you just feel like, all right, I'm in. And I recommend everyone write 30 day clarity challenge on the cover of the notebook with a Sharpie. So it's clear that the only thing this notebook will be used for is that. That's step number one. Step number two is open up your calendar and find a 15-minute window where every day you can devote to doing this. This is crucial, by the way. Don't just get the notebook and say, oh, good, every day I'm going to do this. What you don't schedule won't happen. That's exactly right. And like for me, I personally do it at 10 p.m., which is sort of like my after dinner before sleep window. And I just set an alarm on my phone 10 p.m. every day for the next 30 days. I get a buzz on my phone. And it says 30-day challenge. My mom, who's done the 30-day challenge a few times, is an early riser and likes to do it at 6 a.m. to reflect on the day and prior. Again, whatever works for you, my recommendation is to not do it when you're in like work mode. Lunch breaks I've seen have not worked for people. Doing it in the middle between meetings doesn't work for people. You really want to feel, you know, like you can take a step back and have a moment of solitude. It's blocked off sacred time. Yeah. And I also say, don't do it at the desk where you work from. Oh yeah. Smart. Yeah. Go somewhere. If you do all your Zooms from your couch, go to your bed. If you do all your Zooms from your desk, go outside and sit at a park bench, whatever it is. Okay. So that's step number two. Schedule 15 minutes every day for the next 30 days. Now, step three is over the next 29 days, you're going to answer the same three questions in your journal. And you're going to spend about five minutes per question for 15 minutes each. And these are the three questions. Number one, what filled me with enthusiasm today? God, I love that question. What filled me with enthusiasm today? And the question is very specific. It's not 
what was my favorite part of the day, what made me happiest today, or what went well. People have a very easy job if I ask them, what did you achieve today? Oh, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. There are human doings, not human beings. Yep. The point of the exercise is to focus on being a human being. What builds you up with enthusiasm? Now, people can get intimidated by the word enthusiasm because they think it's like a eureka, heavens are shining on my face moment. That's what I was going to ask. What if someone's like, wait, I didn't do anything that gave me enthusiasm today? I've ridden, yeah, I'm actually on day 29 of my 30-day challenge right now. I'm doing it this month per, just for myself personally. Some of my enthusiasm answers are the bird I saw dancing on my morning hike. So it like, have that to be was my grand. favorite moment of the whole day. Okay. It was the moment where I just felt like my heart flutter. I went and hung out with a friend of mine. He has a three-year-old who I, was, I met for the first time. And playing with that three-year-old yesterday was my answer. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's, oh my God, the writing felt so good. I just felt that enthusiasm. And sometimes the answer is nothing. The answer is nothing filled me with enthusiasm today. So it's okay to put that down. It's okay to have a day where it's nothing. It's okay to put that down, but don't just write the word nothing. It's 15 minutes a day. It's not two minutes a day. It's 15 minutes. So if you're going to write nothing, then you got to fill up the time and say, shit, I wonder why it was nothing. I'm a little depressed that it was nothing. Was it really nothing? Keep writing, keep writing. And even if nothing, let's say you're having writer's block, stare at the page. I've done that sometimes. Sometimes I just stare at the page for like five minutes. Okay, so that's question number one. What filled me with enthusiasm? Question two, what drained me of energy today? People are very good at answering that one. It's not yep. need much explanation. I've had some people come to me and say, oh, the 30 day challenge is broken because my answer to question two was so long every day that I think I was doing it wrong. I was like, no, 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 it's working. <laughs> it's working. By all means, if you have nothing to answer, if you have too much to answer, it doesn't matter. It's working. It's just the third challenge is just reflecting back to you what's going on. Question three is what did I learn about myself today? Love that one too. What did I learn about myself today? And sometimes they can be big realizations. I know for me, six days ago, I wrote, I think the purpose of my life is, and I you know, wrote my answer, which was a huge epiphany. But most of the other days is I'm really happier when I go on hikes. One of the days was I love pizza and bread. It makes me feel like shit for the rest of the day because my <laughs> stomach exploded. Damn, that's annoying. Like that was my yeah, answer for all. But it's a great lesson to learn about yourself. It's a great, I, I love the taste of pizza, mm -hmm. but if I eat too much, like I feel bloated for the rest of the day. Great. That's what I learned about myself today. So those are your three questions. Great props. Yeah. It's for 29 days you're doing those three questions. The last step is day 30. And day 30 is going to be special because day 30 is your graduation ceremony. And what you're going to do for day 30 is instead of 15 minutes, you're going to carve out an hour. And the people who have succeeded the most at the 30-day challenge nail their day 30 by doing one thing. They really treat it like a graduation ceremony. They dress nice. They go to a nice restaurant. They make it festive. They're not in their bed doing this. They really treat themselves like, wow, I'm proud of myself for doing it. So I really encourage people to take day 30 really seriously and go somewhere that feels good for you and carve out that hour. And this is what you're going to do in that hour. You're going to spend about the first 45, 50 minutes simply reading through your first 29 entries. That's got to be a journey in itself. It's a journey in and of itself because you're like, oh man, I forgot I did that. Yeah. Oh wow, I forgot that that's how I felt that night. I like to personally, you don't have to, I like to personally sort of like circle and star things. Just the point is to read it, not like you're reading your own journal, but read it as if you're studying somebody else. You want to have a sense of detachment when you are on day 30. You want to step back the way a anthropologist will study a cave person. Okay. Because what you're looking for is patterns. You're trying to say, well, wow. how does this person tick? You know, if you were the therapist for the person who you were reading their journal entries, what would be your summary? And then what you're going to do in your final 10 minutes on day 30 is you're going to answer three similar questions, but a bit different. What filled me with enthusiasm this month? What filled me with energy this month? What did I learn about myself this month? Because now you've seen the patterns. Now you just now studied you yourself pattern. for 29 days. Exactly. And what you're going to do is unlike the first 29 days where I say, you know, write as much as possible in those 15 minutes, on day 30, you're going to write as little as possible. You're going to try to answer those three questions in one to two sentences max, almost like it was a bold headline. 
And that sheet of paper on day 30 is your graduation certificate, giving you clarity on where you are in your life. And it's going to be pointing you in the direction you should be going next. This is one of the most genius things on the planet. I mean, you're going to see patterns in how you think about money. You're going to see patterns in how you think about your body, your self-image. You're going to see patterns in how you spend your time. You're going to see patterns in who lights you up and who doesn't that you didn't even realize, right? People might be sucking around. This is hands down one of the best tools I have ever come across. That means a lot, man. And you know what I've learned from this, and you'll relate to this a lot, is the 30-day challenge makes a lot of sense for people who are used to exercising. I've learned that athletes and people who have a natural exercise routine pick up the 30-day challenge really easily because they understand one thing. Exercise is boring. You know, going to the gym every day and running on the treadmill is very boring and repetitive. Let me tell you what the 30-day challenge is going to feel like. Boring and repetitive. And repetitive. When you're on day 15, you're going to say, ah, I'm writing the same shit I wrote the past three days all over again. I'm not learning anything new. That's the point. Keep doing it. Boy, you know, when you go to the gym, you don't go, oh man, this treadmill feels just the same as it did yesterday. That's the point. Keep doing it. You're training your muscles. You're training your body. And with the 30 challenge, you're training your mind to be focused on not what you accomplished, but on what filled you with enthusiasm or drained you of energy. You're refocusing how your lens of your life. Alex, this is incredible. What do you do with the lessons? Okay, day 30, you now figured out the three questions, but for the month, right? You figured out what brings you enthusiasm over the course mm -hmm. of the month, what drained you of energy over the course of the month, and what you learn about yourself. So what do you do with that now? Do you do this thing again and keep tracking it? What's next? Again, my whole belief is... I'm not going to tell people what to do. I'm not going to shit on you. Don't shit on me. Yep. What I will tell you is the, again, the clarity leads to awareness. The awareness will naturally lead to changes. Now, for some people, you know, I've seen the 30 day challenge be used by, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people at this point. I've seen some people have realizations that made them change their entire job and career and change industries. I've seen other people who did the 30 day challenge. I know this one engineer at Google I worked with on this 30-day challenge, he wanted to quit his job. I said, do the 30-day challenge and see what you learn. He learned he actually wanted to stay. He just needed to create some boundaries with his team. And he wanted to spend more time doing art on the side. Fascinating. And he said he's more motivated at work than he's ever been. And he didn't change his job at all. His boss doesn't even know anything changed, but he feels completely different. So it's a natural desire, because I have this, to do the 30-day challenge and feel that on day 30, an owl will magically fly through your window with a letter saying, congratulations, Chris, you're going to Hogwarts. This is your life purpose. It's a natural fantasy because that's what we want as human beings. We want certainty. We want to know exactly what's going to unfold. But the reality is that you'll never have a perfect roadmap for your life. At best, realistically, is you'll know the right next step. And that's what the 30 day challenge helps you understand because you can't figure out the right next step until you have a accurate understanding of where you are. In other words, clarity. That's it. And clarity is such a gift, man. I absolutely love this. I love everything that you shared. Where can everybody plug into you? Where can they follow you and how can they add some energy back to you in this energy exchange? Thank you, man. Wherever, you know, people like to, you know, go online, whether it's Instagram or Twitter, it's just at Alex Benayan. And if you like the energy of this conversation, the third door is wherever you like to buy books. So whether that's Amazon, if you like audiobooks, I read the audiobook. It's all there. And if you ended up getting the book because of this podcast, let me know so I can say thank you. Chris, I'm always so energized when I talk to you, bro. I'll do one better. I'll tell you what. When this podcast comes out, every week for 30 days, I'll choose four or five people to send them a third door copy on us from <laughs> us here if they tag you and me in their 30 day clarity challenge, right? So all I you gotta do that, is man. tag us, show the journal. You, you can blurt out the writing if you want, but tag Alex, tag myself. Instagram is probably the best place to do it. And every week I'll choose four or five of you for four weeks after this comes out. Matter of fact, let's give everybody a week to go get their journals. So right. starting one week after this thing comes out, for the next four weeks after that, we'll give away four or five books a week to everyone who tags us. Because it's, I love to give them that instant gratification to keep them going. 
in this I journey that, when it gets repetitive and all that. No, you're the kind of guy everybody needs in their life. <laughs> <laughs> well, right back at you, buddy. Listen, man, thanks for being on. It means the absolute world. Love and appreciate you always. And just know that the world's a better place because you're in it. Thank you, man. The feeling is so mutual. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success. 